were talking about. Are there specific devices or uh, uh, methods of communication which diminish our freedoms in addition to overpopulation and overorganization? Well, there are certainly devices which can be used in this way. I mean, let us uh, take, uh, after all, a piece of very recent and very painful history is the uh, propaganda used by Hitler, which was incredibly effective. I mean, that, what were Hitler's methods? Hitler used terror on the one kind, brute force on the one hand, but he also used a very efficient uh, form of, uh, of propaganda, which uh, uh, he was using every modern device at that time. He didn't have TV, but he had the the radio, which he used to the fullest extent, mm -hmm. and was able to uh, impose his will on an immense mass of people. I mean, the Germans were a highly educated people. Well, we're aware of all this, but how do you equate Hitler's use of propaganda with the way that propaganda, if you will, is used, let us say, here in the United States? Well, Are you suggesting that uh, there no, is a parallel? Needless to say, it's not being used in this way now. But uh, I, I, the point is, it seems to me, that there are, are methods at present available, methods superior in some respects to, to Hitler's methods, which could be used in a bad situation. I mean, I, what I feel very strongly is that we mustn't be caught by surprise by our own advancing technology. This has happened again and again in history. Technology has advanced, and this changes social conditions. And suddenly people have found themselves in a situation which they didn't foresee and doing all sorts of things they didn't really want to do. Well, now, what do you mean? Do you mean that we, we develop our television but we don't know how to use it correctly? Is that the point that you're making? Well, at present, the television, I think, is being used uh, quite harmlessly. It's being used, I think, uh, I would feel it's being used too much to distract everybody all the time. But, I mean, imagine, which must be the situation in all communist countries where the television, where it exists, is always saying the same thing the whole time, is always driving along. It's not creating a wide front of distraction, it's creating a one-pointed uh, drumming in of a single idea all the time. It's obviously an immensely powerful instrument. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the potential misuse of the instrument. Uh, exactly. We have, of course, uh, all technology is in itself morally neutral. These are just powers which can either be used well or ill. It's the same thing with atomic energy. We can either use it to blow ourselves up or we can use it as a substitute for the coal and the To forestall, I mean, after all, the, um, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. You write in Enemies of Freedom, you write specifically about the United States. You say this, writing about American political campaigns. You say all that is needed is money and a candidate who can be coached to look sincere. Political principles and plans for specific action have come to lose most of their importance. The personality of the candidate, the way he is projected by the advertising experts, are the things that really matter. Well, this is, uh, uh, during the last campaign, there was a great deal of uh, this kind of uh, statement by the uh, advertising managers of the campaign parties, this idea that the uh, the candidates had to be merchandised as though they were soap or toothpaste, and that you had to depend entirely on the personality. I'm, I mean, the personality is important, but there are certainly people with an extremely amiable personality, particularly on TV, who might not necessarily be very good uh, uh, in poli poli positions of political trust. Well, do you feel that men like Eisenhower, Stevenson, Nixon, with knowledge of forethought, were trying to pull the wool over the eyes of the American public? Uh, no, but they were, they were being advised by powerful um, advertising agencies who were making campaigns of a quite different kind from what had been made before. And I think we shall see probably uh, all kinds of uh, new devices uh, coming into the picture. I mean, the, for example, this thing which got a good deal of publicity last autumn subliminal projection. I mean, as it stands, this thing, I think, is of uh, no menace to us at the moment. But I was talking the other day to one of the people who has done most experimental work in the in psychological laboratory with this, who was saying precisely this, that it is not at the moment a danger, but once you've established a principle uh, that something works, you can be absolutely sure that the technology of it is going to improve steadily. 
and I mean, his view of the subject was that, uh, well, maybe they will use it to some extent in the 1960 campaign, but they will probably use it a good deal and much more effectively in the 1964 campaign, because this is the kind of rate at which technology advances. And we'll be persuaded to vote for a candidate that we do not know that we are being persuaded to exactly. vote for. Exactly. I mean, this is the rather alarming mm. nature, that you're being persuaded below the level of choice and reason. In, uh, in regard to advertising, which you mentioned just a little ago, in your writing, particularly in Enemies of Freedom, you attack Madison Avenue, which controls most of our television and radio, advertising, newspaper advertising, and so forth. Why do you consistently attack the advertising uh, agency? Well, no, I, I think that uh, advertisement plays a very necessary role, but the danger, it seems to me, in a democracy is this. I mean, what does a democracy depend on? A democracy depends on the individual voter making an intelligent and rational choice for what he regards as his enlightened self-interest in any given circumstance. But what these people are doing, I mean, what both for their particular purposes for selling goods and the dictatorial um, propagandists are doing, is to try to bypass the rational side of man and to appeal directly to these unconscious forces below the surface so that you are, in a way, making nonsense of the whole democratic procedure, which is based on conscious choice. Of oh, hello, uh, Manchester. We're sitting here mesmerized by Aldous Huxley, <laughs> the author of Brave New World, in a 1958 interview with uh, uh, Mike Wallace. And uh, we, this is in the wake of the day after that. Donald, my, my co-host today is Matt Con or maybe you're my guest today. My guest today is Matt Connor. I'm in the guest seat, yes. You're in the guest seat. And we've here, uh, and my friend Thomas Massengale from uh, England, although I forgot your picture, Tom, if you want to send one in. Tom's been caterwauling, and uh, what we know now why we have a, what do, do we have a 30-second delay? Oh, more than that. Here? Yeah, I think I think uh, maybe for Norm or somebody, they made it like five minutes or something. <laughs> no, it is it is a long delay, though. It yeah. is a long delay. Uh, I guess Trump won big in Nevada. Yeah, well. 86% of the vote. Yeah, uh, Trump is inevitable. I, as far as I'm concerned, it's over. It's going to be Trump and Hillary. But, you know, when we were listening to Aldous Huxley, he was talking about... In 1956 was the first year that television actually figured in a presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. Robert Montgomery, who was a uh, actor, he was we know him as Elizabeth Montgomery of uh, Bewitched yeah, Game, the yeah. father. And if if you're that old, you know we're dating ourselves. Even remember, I used to watch her. Bewitched and reruns oh, when I was I had a kid. A crush yeah. on her. Yeah. And uh, he was he was one of the creators of the Screen Actors Guild. And let me oh. write that down. He was Ike's media advisor. He, Ike came off on TV very poorly. You know, he looked like Mr. Clean. Was it Mr. Clean, Tom? And the old, uh, <laughs> there was a uh, a cleaning product with a bald-headed man. Right, Mr. Clean. Right. Oh, yeah. Not quite so buff as Mr. Clean. <laughs> right, right, yeah. And, Ike, and I don't think you'd see Ike with an earring. No. <laughs> That's true. But Ike, Ike, Ike was more, uh, Mr. Clean was more like somebody out of the village people, I think. <laughs> of yeah. his time, in yeah. the 50s. But Ike spoke a particular type of gibberish, and William Loeb of the Union Leader used to call him Dopey Dwight. And it took years for people to realize that Dwight was actually taught, the way he talked, and this is only in hindsight, yeah. was because he had to deal with prima donnas like Douglas MacArthur. Yeah. And right. in you know, a career in the military, and he was a politician, he was not the type of general, uh, you know, like a Patton or a MacArthur, mm -hmm. or somebody like uh, a Marshall, George Marshall, who was a genius in um, managing things. Marshall wanted to go and, and oversee D-Day, but FDR says, I can't, you have to be here in Washington. Right. But Ike was a master politician, keeping the British happy, dealing with the Gaul and everything. So his gibberish was actually a, a type of like military speech. Oh, okay. Where he never really quite says anything. Kind of like, a, you know, a, and then... He can agree with you or disagree with you, even though you thought you agreed or disagreed. <laughs> you, know what, you know what I thought was interesting about Ike was that he, he preferred to be called, even after he had been president, he preferred to be called general. Really? Yeah, yeah. He, he, like Kennedy, when, like during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when JFK was sort of consulting with him and, and you know, reaching out to different people for advice, he, uh, yeah, Eisenhower preferred to be called general. He didn't want to be called uh, Mr. President. And you know what JFK called Ike? What? 
Well, it's a standard for all your co commanders. We call them the old expletive deleted hole. Oh, I didn't know that. That's what you call all your, you know, the, the top Sure, commanders. sure. <laughs> but he had a problem with media, and that was the first consultant. That's the first time that you really had advertising mm. in the end, Madison Avenue and Hollywood interfering in a campaign. Now, it always got my goat that Mad Men, they never really, they only vaguely touched on the fact that how advertising industry was so critical in the political process hmm. and how it developed during, you know, Don Draper's, where does he go? He goes from like 1959 to 1970. Hey, John, can you show us the, uh, the selling of the president? What is that? Oh, it's one of the photos. The, uh, this was a book, a bestseller, and Tom, you probably remember because we people we studied it, you know, when we went to uh, university right. in it's like the late seventies. Joe Joe McInnes, his first book, because he had covered him, I think, for Esquire or something. It was how do you sell Richard Nixon, who mm. was an alcoholic, uh, quite frankly, a psychotic, a Pulitzer Prize winner, just wrote a new biography that the man was all but a psychotic and an alcoholic. Mm. Haldeman in '68 told him, I, I won't be on your campaign if you keep drinking. And the thing is, Nixon fell apart in the 62 campaign, the famous, you won't have Dick Nixon to kick around. Right. How do you sell it? Nobody said that. Nobody said that to Jack, and he drank like a fish. Mm -hmm. Jack who? Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy, uh, I never heard that. Nixon was an actual alcoholic. Now, see, I didn't realize that about Nixon. He was a hard drinker. He was like Churchill. Churchill drank all through the day, but he was a, and suffered from depression, but Churchill had a better who control was the, over himself. Who was the, um, the, somebody, some son's girlfriend was over at Teddy's house down in Florida. Remember when Teddy came out in his boxers and made a capacitor? <laughs> We're not, that's irrelevant. We're talking about how she Madison. Drunk. Oh, you mean Teddy Kennedy, but not J. Yeah, I never Jack heard about brother, JFK. Jack's little brother, yeah. Huh. I've never heard JFK being described as an alcoholic. I doubt he could with all the drugs he was on because of Addison's disease. You yeah. see, him, well, uh, but that's just a cortisol issue. You send steroids. You see him with a lot of drinks in his hand. Yeah, but that's social drinking. You know, Gore Vidal wrote about him because he was uh, related to, to Jackie through marriage. You right. never hear about him being an alky his, or RFK, but Teddy was a hard drinker. Uh, Don Draper was a social drinker in context of his day as well. Well, we're, we're, that's a fictional character talk. What we're focusing on is the selling of the president. <laughs> My father always told me that uh, uh, this was before I had ever seen it, the Frost-Nixon interview. Oh, yeah. With uh, David Frost interviewing Nixon. And, and my dad had always told me, and I, I eventually I finally got to see it, um, that he, he believes Nixon was, as he put it, clinically insane at that point. There's a mm. book. If you look up, uh, I, I, I will talk about it another time. There's a book out by a Pulitzer Prize winner that talks about the presidency and his alcoholism, paranoia. And he, mm. we, he, he was almost a psychotic. They took the football away from him in the end. He was a psychotic. Did they? Yeah. I am oh, not yeah. a nuclear rule. football. Yeah, every order. Because he actually, in 72, wow. took over command of the Air Force from his, the Pentagon. And the Pentagon spied on him. And they actually stealing the papers of him and Kissinger because <laughs> they did not trust him. He's a madman. Interesting. And he went up to the, the defense condition just before. Well, you always, I was in the military and heard these stories. It never happened what is actually the conditions before you go to nuclear war. Yeah. And uh, over uh, 71, uh, was it 71 Bangladesh? No, 71 is the concert for Bangladesh. When was the, uh, was it January 71, Tom? Uh, Bangladesh. I was, was going to say 70, but I'm not sure. East and West Pakistan. Uh, right. East Pakistan became Bangladesh, broke off. We were a client. Pakistan, West Pakistan, Karachi was our client. Yeah. LBJ had visited them. We, nobody trusted the Indians because they were not aligned. Yeah. And uh, so Nixon went all the way, uh, tried to support the Pakis. He put uh, us in the defense condition before nuclear war. And he justified it by saying he wanted the Chinese and Russians to think he was crazy enough to, you know, wow. nuke them. That mutual assured destruction. He would just do it. Then you start, and he took us up to the defense, that similar thing in the uh, Yom Kippur War. Uh, Is that the, the March, March 26, 1971. Is that oh. DEFCON when you talk about the defense? Uh, right. Okay. Uh, you know, it's 
the bombers are ready, the bomber, but uh, in another time, like in the 80s, it'd be the fighter bombers in uh, England. Yeah. Uh, during, I wasn't in that point, but I heard about it. Second Solidarity Crisis, Brezhnev, they were afraid, was going to invoke the Warsaw, uh, the Brezhnev Doctrine, and put the Warsaw Pact troops into uh, Poland. Mm. But uh, Kaspar Weinberger stared him down. Right. Because they had all the, it, you have all those uh, fighter bombers scrambled in England, which is like an aircraft carrier. And right. they would come in and... Now, when Nixon did this, was it public knowledge that he had... Uh, uh, Jack, the... uh, Jack Anderson broke it in 71. No kidding. Yeah, because whatever there was, whatever tacit gentleman's agreement... And when you go with the press, there's gentleman's agreements. Like yeah. in 2008, everybody knew about Edwards... Uh, and his mistress and his bastard son. Yeah, who was the oh, inquirer well, that ended up breaking the story? <laughs> right, because they had yeah. to, there was a gentleman's agreement. Yeah. And you break the story when it'll do you the best. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, steroids, the use of steroids, Balco and all that. The, the press, you know, the press that caterwauls about Roger Clemens and about uh, Barry Bonds. They all, <laughs> they all knew what was sure. happening. Right near where I used to work used to be the Balco place. They'd go get shot up, and then they'd go to a hooker. Now, right, right, you know, they got Jerry <laughs> Rice, I remember. He was just going for a deep tissue massage. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's not like people don't know this is going on. Right. And then the press, you know. Oh my God! We can get these people in the the Hall of Fame, and uh, but uh, Nixon—they manufactured the new Nixon. Yeah, but and Barry's back on the field, my friend. Who's back in the field? Barry Bonds. What do you mean back in the field? We're supposed Hitting to have a coach. We were going to have a baseball show today, but the uh, hitting coach for the Marlins. <laughs> No kidding. I was about to yeah. say that. I, I was just about to ask Bob. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's, we're going to do gonna that. Sh- the, he's going to be in the dugout again. We're going to do that show in a week or two. Or maybe next week. Ah, uh, promises, promises. <laughs> hey, i got to read up on stuff. I don't even know where anybody is. But Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World, said they needed it. All you needed with the media, which mes- he, later on he'll talk about mesmerization. Right. Remember we were going to talk about that. Yeah. And uh, all you need is a sincere candidate. And, of course, we got no, Trump. Who's that's act- not what he said, a candidate who can appear to be sincere. Appear to be sincere, right. 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 You and don't need a sincere candidate. That would right. disqualify everyone who's running. <laughs> <laughs> he, wouldn't be a po- he or she wouldn't be a politician. I mean, the favorites, you know, the favorites would be completely out of the box on that one. <laughs> and then you appeal below the level of reason, you use the subconscious, and it subverts democracy, which you need an intelligent and rational choice. Right. That's how you get people to vote against their own right. self-interest, yeah. And he also talks in this, it's a, you can go on to YouTube and look up all this Huxley 1958 interview. He talks about subliminal seduction, which remember when we were at university in the 70s, that was a very hot t- uh, topic, subliminal seduction. Mm, right. And, you know, I've got, I mean, I've got to say, I worked at Ogilvy and Mather. And you I've did got to it? Say you the, worked? The whole concept of subliminal seduction was so overplayed in people's minds compared to how it was actually used in advert. I mean, it wasn't used day-to-day in advertising. It was nonsense. The point about advertising was, and uh, I always thought Madman really uh, blew this too, is uh, the use of psychology in manipulating the subconscious. Right. Mm-hmm. Because uh, it was, I always think Lucian Freud was a nephew, a great nephew of Freud, and he was the great painter. The father of modern advertising was one of Freud's nephews or something. Right, and but not by inserting subliminal tricks, which is the premise of that book. Right, they were all thing like they're, they're putting skulls in and stuff that you don't see. Right, but, I mean, forensically, you can go back and see all sorts of things that aren't actually there. Right, just like you could see canals on Mars. Just and, like Paul sure. McCartney was dead. Right, we, <laughs> we could have a whole show about that. Yeah. The point is, with cognitive behavioral th- uh, theory, you can actually... With the they from the EEG, they know they knew from research even in the fifties, probably earlier, what parts of the brain could be stimulated. Mm-hmm. But with the MRI, it's like a map into the brain. Yes, you can right. use cognitive behavioral theories to really, uh, if you read uh, manuals for therapists, that certain words, certain sounds you use can actually activate different parts of the brain. Right. We learn a right, lot of that. Right. In- Do you actually believe political? campaigners and politicians 
have a clue about any of this. Their people do. Other, with, with the exception of a few advisors, well, I think I would say they don't. I, I think I think candidates learn this stuff the same way someone in sales learns it. You know, they may not understand all the the mechanics of it, but I, I mean, I don't think they're I don't think they're learning how you know the different parts of the brain react to, to certain things. But I think they I think they learn probably. You know, I'm a I'm a hypnotherapist, and they probably right. learn at least as much as I learn. And what did about you learn? How to yeah. how to use certain right. words. Um, in fact, uh, in, during my training, um, yeah. one of one of my uh, instructors talked about how Bill Clinton is a master at this, using visual cues, for example. During one of the the 96 debates with Bob Dole, he would say things like he would sound like he was sort of. Um, trying to be uh, deferential to Dole by saying something like, now we have a lot of problems and I don't blame uh, Senator Dole for any of this, but we do have a problem with, you know, uh, something like higher deficits. And he would gesture in Dole's direction while he's saying it. Yeah. After oh, just okay. saying, he doesn't blame Dole for any of this, but, he, but then as he's listing off the problems, he's gesturing in Dole's direction. So uh, Bill Clinton clearly understood that makes sense you know, because Bill being... But I, I would argue with Bill Clinton, it may very well be that it's not that he was consciously aware of it, but that he was, you know, he was Bubba. He was very good at drawing people in. Right. And I don't want to... Manipulating is such a negative word. It's a charge. And I don't mean it in a negative sense. Right. But he was a master at manipulating people and drawing them in to where he wanted them to go. Right. Well, I've actually seen him at work and met him a few three times and the fact that he's from arkansas despite being a Rhodes scholar yale law and all that mm -hmm. you're dealing with a people that let's just say their consciousness but from mississippi you know their big prayer but from mississippi we'd be last in everything education <laughs> everything right and before radio the first mass communication device other than the you know the actual newspaper there was a thing called elocution and you'd mm. learn these gestures if you go on to YouTube and look at Will, who is it, Will Hayes, who had been a hack, the Postmaster General of the Harding administration, then he went to Hollywood, the Hayes Code and everything. Yeah. And there's one of the first sound films, he's talking about sound films, and he does stuff like this, yeah. that, and yeah. this. And you were taught that. And if you look at old silent films, you've got all this stuff. It's just not this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. But there's these things like this and all sorts of gestures that to illiterate people actually stimulate. It's actually a form of communication. Mm -hmm. but, but gestures in that. Look yeah. at the difference between the Clintons. I mean, Bill. Yeah, he grew up in Arkansas right, where people are. About it, you don't know but, if that's your do, mother <laughs> or your third cousin or the same thing. You close know? close but, families in Arkansas, yes. Have you ever lived in one of those places, Tom? Have you ever been in the I army think, with people from places like that? I do that? think it's Jeez. possible that Bill was a Bill is a natural. <sighs> He's a that and man. That, to, that, that's a brilliant man, Clinton, Tom. I mean, I don't mean to insult your girl or anything. It's not my when girl. You watch Mrs. Clinton. She's so clearly trying to manipulate people with her facial expressions and her gesticulation. Yeah. But she, it doesn't work. I mean, she doesn't. No one, is, no one is watching on television. It's one of her big problems. No yeah. one is drawn in by that stuff. It, 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 she, she looks like you can tell she's trying. Bill makes well, it yeah. effortless. Right. Yeah, but Bill grew, Bill grew up in a different milieu. Right. Where to get through to a friggin' knucklehead, you have to use everything. Yeah. I was. I, we were with my father down selling siding. My brother and I, the teenagers, down in rural Georgia. Yeah. Jesus, it's like being <laughs> in another reality. <laughs> He wouldn't even, he stopped selling white people because he realized the Southern Baptists can't be sold anything. They have no dream, Tom, because their dream is coming in, you know, right, right. in the but next what, world. Their reward is well, on the other side. What just said, I think, is very true. Yeah. Reverend you know, I he didn't just make it look effortless. For Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton is a master of interacting with people yeah. in an instinctive level, not a trained level. Yeah, but he's a genius, and too. He, you yeah. can say a but few yes, words to him, and he understands. But he is a I've never seen anybody like it. At inter interpersonal communication. But the point is, he's mastering things. I see what you mean because of the crew. You know, Ronald Reagan at this time in 1980, people at bought in Boston University, Harvard was speaking. Whether on January 20th, 1981, the president would be still be Carter or it'd be Teddy Kennedy. Nobody 
took Ronald Reagan seriously. Right. He was to us. He was a washed-up TV actor because right. we never thought, you know, he's the governor of California. You know, you, but then he, but then he gets that tag as the great communicator, which, which I've never really understood. He was an actor, and yeah. with and with Trump. We've got uh, a t reality TV star. Right. And that's just the role he's playing. He's just a hustler. Well, I always feel yeah. that watching Trump, that I'm not watching Donald Trump the person. No. I'm watching Donald Trump the television character. Joe yep. Kelly Lavasso told me, in pro you know, perfectly sane. Per but people are different, you know? Yeah. Uh, Bill Clinton is like, you know, I I I've never, like, been in a back room with him. God knows we'd probably, uh, you know, what would go on. But... Uh, <laughs> He seems to be John, the same what are you person. <laughs> Where a lot of people that we were talking about Al Gore, yeah, in private, completely different person to the wooden Indian he is. Well, Hillary, I, and we've talked about this because you, I, I've never met Hillary. You have, but um, a lot of people have said, and, and you've said this too, that she's very different. That she's much warmer in person then she comes across on television. On television, she comes across as like, you know, like Tom was saying, like she's trying to be kind of like her husband when it's obvious that she's trying too hard. But That person, woman, that woman, what, everything you hear about her, tough as nails, never gives up. And uh, well, that there's I'd a person that him. honestly could go face to face with Putin and back him down. Look what Bubba's put <laughs> <laughs> That's what they hooked up, you know, in 1970 or right, whatever. Right, right. That woman in siding, in the siding, the old, the old siding business that doesn't exist anymore. There are two terms. There's a closer, which Bill Clinton is. But there's also the highest praise you can give is he can handle a hot stove. You know, go into hmm. a, a failing sa uh, sale or with a difficult client or, or handle the cops when they show up. I, yeah. I, I've been in that situation. And... Uh, <laughs> And handle it. You, right, you, right. Well, we're gonna, not everybody we're can gonna, do that. We're going to see if she can handle the sale. Yeah, right. We're not saying she's a closer, but see, we got Donald Trump. My prediction: Trump will be president. I, I think it's going to be Hillary. Well, Hillary. I'm, I'm not gonna, voting for either of them, but Hillary will get the nomination because the, it's the system. And uh, but Trump can run through on the left on trade. Hey, come on in. I, come on, sit I, down. We got Peter White here. Peter, come in here. I couldn't even see who it was under the under the lights. I Peter, come in and sit down. I can't right now. I'm, I'm in the middle of I'd like to make my prediction well, just come for, say the, hello. for the election. Okay. okay. I think it's going to be Lloyd Blankfein. Who the hell is he? I've heard the name. Lloyd Blankfein. Oh, uh, the hell is Lloyd Blankfein? He's the head of uh, Goldman Sachs. He's the Sachs. current and future president of the United States. Oh, my goodness. I had no idea. And why why can't we say the the first uh, syllable of his name? Is it like is it like the F word Lloyd or something? Nolan? No, Lloyd. I was making a joke because it's blank. I, I was uh, sorry, uh, this is uh, a bad uh, bad joke. Uh, it, 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 that it was. <laughs> <laughs> we 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 don't have the freedom uh, on uh, Manchester Public TV. Yes. That was Peter White, by the way. Peter White has uh, there's an exciting announcement. That's where I'm wearing the orange jacket. Yes, yes. But uh, we'll hold off until Peter joins us. We're going to try to be calling a Craig. Jesus, I still I I I'm finally going to get those glasses. From the <laughs> Craig Thomasahoff, who wrote a book called The Can't Can't in Dates. Hey John, can you show us the cover of the Candidates, the book? It's his book about people like Vermin Supreme, mm. all the weirdos that come to New... Uh, not that, that Vermin Supreme is a weirdo, that no, come no. to New Hampshire and run. Oh, there no, it is. That's, uh, oh. that's Jingle Dell. He's a state rep that disappeared. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, he, the book, Candidates. I, uh, I do have it there, don't I? Or do we take it off the thing with Craig? I was very proud, by the way, to cast my vote for Vermin Supreme in the primary. He didn't get a Excellent. Well votes. done. No. What's that, Tom? Well done. Thank you. Thank you. He Did came you get in, your pony? He came in can fourth. Can you go on the, uh, for when I call, call Craig, can you go on to the uh, stick and find it? Or is that too late? It's there somewhere. It's got a number on it. Is Vermin running a national campaign or is it just New Hampshire? I, th I think he was done after New Hampshire. I think he wanders around a few places. Yeah, yeah. He's, he said he was going to go to the uh, the conventions, remember? Right, right. But he can't raise money in the South because the whole toothbrush thing, they're not into that down there. They don't care. They don't have any teeth. Right, so exactly. Know. There we go, oh. the, can the candidates. And why don't we give him a call? 
since we're uh, our, our our discussion about mesmerizing. Uh, should should we use the studio phone? Oh, I got to get his phone number. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> Matt, yes. that's why I have you on because w without you, I'd be uh, raving about Stinky Gerard when uh, oh. and running uh, Middle Mel and a hula hoop. <laughs> hey, what about me? <laughs> yeah, what about Tom? We're supposed to talk about baseball, but you said it was too early. I'd hey, have to you tap said out it was on too that. Early. I, I know nothing about. I, I don't know anything about baseball. I don't even know how many quarters are in a game. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you're not. I knew you weren't much of an American after I saw you on Gary Hopper's show. That's right. <laughs> I like the fact how the uh, 128 shots, it must have been God that saved them. Oh, <laughs> you ever uh, read some of the stuff? Finnegan. God told me to go. It's, it's like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My brother could hit 99 out of 100. Well, now, let's talk about how the candidates have or have not been mesmerizing. No, nope, we're going to call Craig. Lunch. Please stand by. It's a very good speaker good God. phone. It's ringing. Nobody ever calls in my show. Not even Mrs. X. Yeah. Hello? Craig, is that you? Uh, it is. I, I believe, yeah, no, it's me. Craig, is that you? Welcome to Ward 13 with John Hopwood. I have a guest, the Matt Connerton, who has his own show right after mine. Let, let, let me tell you, you're live, and we're not I'm allowed to have no respect here. Tom, will you stop catawong? We have this. Uh, <laughs> we have a, a crank from uh, uh, England on too. But uh, wow. can you show the picture of Craig John uh, without giving me too much grief? <laughs> we took it. We would just show. Go ahead. I'm afraid to know what picture you're using. The one you sent me. John, are you oh, there? Good. We have a. Uh, the one from the old uh, adult film day. He oh used my. to do the adult film uh, database with what's his name, uh, yeah, Luke I'm Ford. By my definition of adult films is different. It's just a bunch of guys sitting around yelling at kids to get off their lawn. So. Oh, we're not talking about Luke yeah. Ford then. You don't know Luke Ford. You are you were in Los Angeles uh, County, right? I I am indeed. Yes. Are you uh, Angelino itself, or do you live in one of the autonomous? Uh, I, I don't think there really is uh, a, an actual Los Angeles here. I'm in the San Fernando Valley, the, the great uh, don't hate us uh, San Fernando Valley. Hey, my uh, ex uh, is, was from the San Fernando Valley, but I, I used to uh, harass her for being a Simi Valley girl. I think that's one of the reasons uh, she left me because uh, what was it? Uh, I was a professional pain in the ass. Oh. I think we can say that. Yes. Okay. That's... I was just in the <laughs> Simi Valley. Could I ask you? Right. What are the hours like when you're a professional pain in the ass? Are the, are the hours good? Uh, That's well, a 24-7. Yeah, I'm a freelancer. Yeah. <laughs> you need me at 3.30 wow. a.m. up at the ward to get things ready for uh, someone who thinks they're going to be a, the next president of the United States. Oh, I'll, I'll do it. They could have used you in Nevada. Well, it's all, uh, but uh, I was last in California just in December and going through the Simi Valley. The, uh, I realized that I had to go to the bathroom, and there was the Ronald Reagan Library, and he'd been my <laughs> former commander in chief, and a very, a very Hemingway esque thing. If one of his his worst novels, probably Across the River and Into the Trees, where a colonel goes to, of World War II goes to where he was wounded, and uh, defecates on the spot he was wounded. So I figured Dutch is my commander in chief, and rather go to a uh, you know a seventy six station, I went up to the library. Yeah. Got a cup of coffee, wow. used the men's room, and I bought a Ronald Reagan Library cup for Joe Kelly Levasseur. Oh, so. very nice. I'm sure you appreciated it. We were just rapidly, talking about Dutch Reagan, but Tom, what do you rapidly, have to say? This is rapidly becoming the Joe Franklin show. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I want to be on radio, too. That's right. Hey. <laughs> Craig, tell us about <laughs> your book, Candidates. Uh, and, I, I would love to. It's... Uh, a chronicle of my 10,000 mile journey last spring to meet real people who run for president. I, I you know, we, have, we all complain that we don't like our choices. We all grew up being told anybody could be president. Um, and so I figured, why not go and, and meet some of the actual people you'll never hear about who will never win? <laughs> so uh, it's my chronicle of that trip and uh, 15 people in particular that I met uh, along the way who, who fascinated me to one degree or another. 
Hey, can I, uh, John? Can you put the his book uh, cover on the back of the screen? I know uh, you, the labor. It's like the labors of Hercules for you, but uh, <laughs> that was uh, probably not the thing to say to him. A Herculean effort, yes. Uh, we ha actually had Vermin Supreme on my show. Then he was on Matt's show, and then he was on another show. And, uh, and I voted we actually, for Matt Cornish had actually voted for him. Yes, Matt. Why don't you take over the interview? Um, so we don't get, the, we're not getting that. Oh, okay. <laughs> John, are you there? What? Well, um, candidates, the book cover. Can we have it on yeah. the back screen? Here for you. Oh, oh, okay. And then just go, go between and show us. Uh, you know, use your discretion uh, when we talk. We're going to talk about vermin. There's a couple pictures. Oh, okay. So. I'm, well, I'm curious how many candidates are in the book or or candidates other than I mean, obviously um, vermin's in there, but. There, in the in the, the actual interviews, there are 15. The, the process of doing the book, I interviewed about 100 plus people. The uh, it, it began actually almost exactly a year ago, March 1st of last year, where I wanted to uh, go on the Federal Election Commission site to see how many people had actually already started running for president because none of the the cable news ready people had already had uh, applied. There were 193 people. I guarantee huh. outside of urban you've never heard of. Right. <laughs> uh, and I I wrote letters to all of them. I heard back from about 100. Interviewed those hundred. Mm. Uh, and some of them are referenced in the book, but the the ones that I drove around to meet with, there were 15 of them. How did you choose the 15? Were they just the 15 most interesting or most unusual? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a combination of all that. Uh, well, I believe that, you know, you don't have to be crazy to do this. We, we all kind of roll our eyes. And, <laughs> uh, and I certainly found when I was out in New Hampshire uh, primary week where everybody, I was crazy to write about these people. Hey, did you do Rocky? Did you do what Rocky? Did I, did I what? That guy, Rocky. He's uh, Rocky. Oh. The Hispanic yeah, guy. Yeah, no, actually, Rocky had not... Um, filed his paperwork by oh. the time I was doing the book a year ago. 40 I states. I did actually talk with Rocky. Really? Oh, okay. I'm going to go talk to him again later in the week. Oh, when you were here for the primary? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I did not know of him until then, but uh, but I uh, actually had a conversation with Rocky while he was getting a shave, so, uh, which I've never done with a candidate before. <laughs> so that How much money does it take? For somebody like Rocky to be on the ballot in 40 states. Yeah, that's I can't even be. remember. I don't even know his name, and I saw him give a, th a 90 second speech huh. at Larry Lessig's. Um, uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I would say the, the money is uh, beyond anything I will earn in my lifetime, uh, but every state <laughs> has a different. Hey, Tom, uh, you can run for this, president. <laughs> well, Carly yeah. Fiorina, dude. Well, the, the misconception <laughs> is that you need money to run for president. Like it, it certainly helps, but yeah. you don't actually need to make a dime. And everybody that I talk to in my book has zero money. Will probably spend very little on a campaign. There's a mom in the Ozarks I talk to who has she gets by and made five hundred dollars a month, which comes from friends and family mostly. Yeah. Uh, and every dollar she gets, she makes cookies, puts them in little bags, and goes down the hill to her little town and tries to sell, has a bake sale basically to raise money for her campaign. So that, that's what I call grassroots. She's from the Ozarks. She might be a, a uh, close cousin of Bill Clinton. That's true. Yeah. I, think, I think Vermin said he spent, what, a couple grand? Was it was it going to go up to ten grand, or was it just a couple? I think that was a goal. But well, we were so uh, mesmerized by him. Uh, geez. The boot. How, hey, John, can you show a picture thing? of uh, Vermin Supreme when he's on the show? Blowing up his bat. <laughs> no, that, that's my Dukakis. <laughs> and, and the, oh, there, there we go. go. Yes. <laughs> we have a picture. Easy mistake. Easy mistake to make. He <laughs> is... <laughs> There's Vermin. <laughs> Vermin Supreme 2016. He's become, since 2008, when he had a galosha on his head, which was not that becoming. He's become like the mascot yeah. of the New Hampshire primary. Yes. I almost voted for him until I got dragooned into uh, serious uh, <laughs> political work. Right. If you're going to have a protest uh, vote, what the hell? I think Vermin's the man for... It wasn't a protest vote for me. I think he's the man for the job. What's Vermin Supreme really <laughs> like? Uh, Vermin is, uh, and uh, I don't know if he'll like me saying this, but uh, probably one of the smartest people I've ever met. Uh, uh, no, I believe it. And, and certainly out of the 15, the, the 
I, I was going to say crafty, and that's not the right word, but the, the one who has the keenest understanding, I think, of how things work. Uh, mm. And uh, he's, he's a, a, a great guy. I think there's a, an undercurrent of seriousness about him that, uh, that yeah. doesn't probably show. But cause Shows a little. I have memory of him. Uh, if, if you discount my playing putt putt golf with him uh, outside of his house <laughs> uh, in Rockport, uh, we, we did play a mean game of putt putt. He has his own uh, golf course? Or is it just. He's got, he, he's got his own course. And he, he never invited uh, us. No. Oh. Oh. You know, he is, yeah. it, it's a brilliant satire, and I know Tom's going to go wild with this. You know, we have one candidate offering free uh, higher education. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think that the free free ponies, and we actually got him on the show, too, wasn't it? Because we had Bonnie, right? Yes. Who was of, she's you. against ge genetically modified organisms, just like my friend Tom from England. And we got him, he was going to genetically modify those ponies, remember? So they'd have a... A smaller f uh, green footprint. Print. Right, which I think is a wonderful one. idea. He, pro he drew Tom, you were on the show, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, uh, I'm for that, by the way. My daughter wants a pony, and I don't really want one in the house, but if they can make it smaller, then I'm all for it. I remember my mother seeing a, one of those miniature horses yeah. in Pennsylvania during the bicentennial, and it could actually count. That, uh, oh, well, it's, it, if they're all that smart, then great. Well, that's a horse, though, not a pony. We'll so. have to ask Rich Gerard if we can is, if we could run that for Stop president. Stop now with that Rich Gerard stuff. <laughs> oh, yep. Now I'm going to get a Facebook message from Rich. You were on Opwood's show, and he said something bad about me. Uh, no. <laughs> hey, the little Mel in the hula hoop with the theme from Lolita. Nelson Riddle's theme from Stanley Kubrick's Lolita. Uh, I didn't put it up. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> um, I, Jeez, I take it you're all pro pony then. Oh yeah, very pro yes. pony. Yes, except I don't want it to be like Canada, where you got to wait in line for a pony. I but just want to be able to get my pony. But it's registered, right? It is registered and mandatory, as too. it should be. Yes, yeah. as it should be. Well, I'm you know, if I could ask you like a, a theoretical question, if you're all pro pony, then and, and I'm curious. Which would you rather have, a, a, uh, a dinosaur-sized pony or a pony-sized dinosaur? Pony-sized dinosaur, definitely. That sounds dangerous to me. I was, you're too young, but what was the gas station that had Dino uh, as their... Uh, the Sinclair. Sinclair. Sinclair, yeah. Really? Which became S... No, that's Exxon. Sinclair was... There used to be so many gas stations. Yeah. Ones. The Seven Sisters, Standard Oil... Yeah, I remember. Well, I used to Dino, and I would get. I got a bl about sixty four. I got to blow up uh, Dino the dinosaur <laughs> about this big. Yeah. Oh, I definitely oh, go no. for. Yeah. I, I, I had one of those too, actually. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I hope you don't mind uh, dogs on your show. Oh no, no, Tom, are you ever going to have your dogs on the show? I can, yeah. You should, but we're going to okay. have to put them on the camera. Okay. Tom, Tom has a show. No, Tom has uh, two dogs. Uh, two or three. Understood. John has a show too. Oh yes, yes. Oh, this <laughs> show's gone to the show. this show's gone to the dogs. Ha <laughs> I see what I did there. Uh, That's all messed up. Uh, there. Right. Let's try to be punny. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? What? I, I don't understand. Uh, th <laughs> this is New Hampshire. Have a serious question. <laughs> this is New Hampshire oh. humor. Tom, Tom has a serious question. Oh okay. Craig, why no Kindle version? Why is there not a Kindle version of your book, Craig? Uh, there shall be hopefully within the week. Uh, the oh. problem is uh, getting it transferred into the Kindle version, uh, working with a smaller publisher who uh, is new to all this. So I, I promise you it should be ready within, uh, hopefully within a week. Excellent. Oh, good. There you we go. We are working on it. Now, and, so uh, you, can, you can interviewed people who can't it? possibly be president. What? You, Tom, speak up. You interviewed up. people who are running who can't possibly be president. What was the question? Uh, is that right? Why don't you relay the question, is it, Matt? Why not hear me? Well, we don't. Yeah. You're, you're not up that hot. Uh, yeah, he, I just, I, I just want to know if Senator Ted Cruz would be included in that list. Oh, would, would <laughs> <laughs> he wants to know if Senator Ted Cruz would be well, <laughs> should have been included in your book as somebody as that a, can't be president as a candidate. Uh, is, uh, if I was going to include those kind of people, then it would have been a you know double the size of the book. Yeah. Uh, Jim Gilmore would I would have just done a whole Jim Gilmore book. <laughs> I met Jim um, Gilmore on primary all day. I know, all I know 
when I was in New Hampshire, <laughs> Ted Cruz gave me a nice hug, and uh, so I can't talk bad about him now. Jeez, uh, he gave you a hug, huh? Did did, did you get excited? <laughs> he uh, is I, nuts. I'm not to look. But. He is nuts. Did he have a lot of brill cream in there? I've noticed he's using less of it. I think because he looks younger with less of it. Less. Uh, now we were talking about uh, those Politifact when they mm. do they rate the candidates by uh, truthfulness. Yeah. What would Ted Cruz is uh, zero? Have we ever had a candidate zero truthfulness? <laughs> but get, talk about uh, Jim Gilmore is in your book, well, Craig, because Matt's met. Uh, what? Jim, we're talking about Jim Gilmore. Matt has actually met Jim Gilmore. I, I met him while I was waiting in line to vote on primary day. He was just kind of working the line, just shaking hands with everybody, saying, I am Jim Gilmore. Was he running as a Democrat? No, a Republican. And he's a Libertarian. Is he? Who was the Libertarian candidate? Uh, well, there was Rand Paul, who was the closest thing to a Libertarian. But um, Who did you meet? The, yeah, I think that. Who is what? Jim Gilmore? I'm getting confused. Governor of uh, a southern state, I forget which state, and a lot of people probably don't know, which is why he had no chance. He really didn't. He, he was at the kids' table debates. He was. He was never on the main stage for the Republicans. What southern state? I can't remember. I can't remember. He's Virginia. Virginia. He's a uh, Virginia governor. Okay. He's the governor of Virginia, and he's in the he, he's former, right? Governor. He's not currently governor, right? That's uh, Terry. Uh, what's his name? Who's the governor of Virginia now? Uh, Terry somebody. All I know is Jim Gilmore was willing to also give me a nice handshake and hold up the book. So uh, that was almost a reason to not vote for him all the time. <laughs> so he, is Jim Gilmore in your book? Uh, no, but, you know, again, uh, now that he's been so warm and, and fuzzy with me, next time, perhaps. Well, tell us, uh, tell us the 15. I, I can guarantee what? Tell us who the other 14 are. You wrote about Vermin Supreme. Uh, Vermin is there. There is uh, another one, I'm sure. Uh, I'm surprised they haven't gotten more uh, attention. Uh, somebody who actually got accepted uh, by the FEC by the name of Sydney Voluptuous Buttock. Uh, <laughs> oh, I would have voted for her. Sydney? Sydney? Is it a Sydney, mayor? like S Y D N E Y, Sydney Voluptuous Buttock. Oh, my. Male or female? Uh, which uh, I, I'm still not sure how real they are in that uh, when I went to... The buttocks or the candidacy? <laughs> uh, well, Sydney didn't show up, but two, like, 20-something guys in, in Buffalo, New York showed up to say they were representing the city. Oh, okay. Uh, who I'm still not sure exists. Um, but uh, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that the government did look at that application and went, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Looks good on a ballot. Hey, uh, Vermin Supreme told us that's his real name, though. So hmm? he could have changed his name to a voluptuous. <laughs> he could if only he thought of that. Yes. <laughs> uh, it, well, I tried actually to connect uh, Vermin and Sydney, and I don't know that they ever, because that would have been a perfect uh, the Supreme Buttocks campaign. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Hey, John, can we see that uh, picture again of uh, Jingle Dell, the state rep? He sounds like voluptuous buttocks. If he moved to New Hampshire, he could easily get into the House of Representatives. What did you say? The, the, this is a state rep who disappeared. You said? Oh yeah, really? Jingle Dell. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know that story. From where? Where's Jingle Dell from? We or if we can see if we can ever see the thing. Not from New Hampshire, is he? Oh yeah. See? Really? Can we could throw that in the back? Oh, there we go. He looks Delbert like Delbert Jingle Dell Fortune. He's from Cornish. Cornish really? is where. Uh, Tom, isn't Cornish, New Hampshire, where J.D. Salinger is from? Don't know. He, he was uh, one of those people. Uh, they is that right? Is this real? He looks like Aaron Eckert, the actor. That's not. No, that's Jingle Dell Fortune. And he disappeared. You see, there's the uh, black glove. I see. And, uh, I see a couple uh, of spaceships there. And look at over to the uh, the right. Daniel Webster's been. Oh. Strange, weird scenes inside the gold mine. That's oh New Hampshire God. politics. Yes. And my point is, if Jingle Dell can get elected <laughs> and be kidnapped by aliens or whatever, why not voluptuous buttocks? Now, Absolutely. can I ask Craig another question? Okay, Craig. Uh, we will relay the question. Okay, Craig. Uh, he can't Matt, hear you. Matt, Matt and I are both yeah, kind of disappointed by the roster of people who are running for president this year and we'd like to see hopwood on the ballot next go round what advice would you give to hopwood if he's going to run for president well uh, the question is 
What advice would you give me if I were to run for president? I did run for state rep and uh, lost 34 votes uh, to Tammy well, Simmons. Yeah, well, which is very close. It is and it isn't. Do you right? need advice? Mm. What would uh, advice would you give me if I wanted to vote for president? It? Yeah. Uh, I will be making my triumphal return to New Hampshire in 2019. Basically <laughs> to separate him from these losers who are candidates and make him an actual candidate. <laughs> I don't think that's his brief, Tom. He <laughs> thinks, what would it take to, to separate a candidate like uh, Voluptuous like Bonox? Like you, Alport. Uh you know, Tom, I think that uh, the time's getting short and we might be turning you off. <laughs> Censorship. <laughs> Tom, Matt, do you have any do you have a real question for our candidate? A, a, a real question. I think I, I think you I think you should run for something, but uh no. Um so Did I have the grand inquisitor? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Run, John, run. Well, I'm curious, will, will there be more books in the future? Is this something you're going to do every four years, uh, put out a new book with a new set of candidates? Uh, I, I don't know if I have the energy to do that. Um, it's been the driving 10,000 miles in three weeks. Wow. Uh, was not the best uh, you know, thing to do for my, uh, my personal health. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, we'll, we'll see the reaction to this. Uh, considering the eye rolling that I've got this time around, I'm not sure that I want to go through it again. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the notion, you know, I mean, we all grew up, I think, being told anybody could be president. Uh, <laughs> right. And then we also, which is a lie, like Santa Claus. Right. Uh, right. But then we also keep getting scolded every week by media, by everybody, about not participating in the system. Right. So I would like to continue to do something where exploring people who go, ah, you know what, screw it. I, I'm going to be a part of it no matter how crazy everybody thinks I am. Right. I, I'm fascinated by that topic, so I might continue to explore. Pe people who go, you know what, I'm going to do this thing where I'm going to lose all my friends, everybody's going to think I'm nuts, uh, I'm going to lose money, and at the end of the day I won't succeed. Like, who does that? Other than the radio host who decides oh. that's the thing. Yeah. Uh, and I'm fascinated by it. You know, it's funny, too, just kind of a side note about the, uh, you know, we're scolded about, you know, oh, you have to vote. It's important to vote. We're always told that. But then there's examples, you know, you've got the Republicans trying to figure out how they're going to steal the uh, nomination away from Trump at the convention. No. And you've got the Democrats manipulating the delegates through superdelegates to make sure that Hillary yeah. can't lose. No, it's that like, was done in 80 and 84. Sure. But I'm, ju I'm just saying it's like, you're, you're, yeah, your vote counts, eh, except when it doesn't. Right. That's the system, though. <laughs> yeah. It's right in the Constitution. Hey, let's talk about your other career. Uh, if I remember correctly from uh, your radio interview with Joel Elber and Peter White uh, during the primary, not only did you write for TV Guide, but didn't you, weren't you a writer on Behind the Music? I, I, well, you scared me with the other career thing. I the read, Reader's the Digest? <laughs> was it Reader's um, Digest or TV Guide? <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. No, I was yeah I was the executive editor of TV Guy for about eight years. Uh, oh. Yeah, no, I back when people enjoyed watching behind the music, I did probably five or six of those. Uh, and who 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 were they? Mm. Who were the musicians? Le did you do the Leaf Garrett uh, one? <laughs> I remember that the, one. The what? Yeah, everybody remembers the Leaf Garrett behind. Uh, that's the first you oh, know tear well, jerker. I, yeah. I, I didn't do the Lee Garrett one, but I did the follow-up, the Little Steve follow-up to the Lee Garrett one, where we went out with uh, Roland Winkler, the guy you know who got injured in the accident, and uh, oh. I did spend some time with him, and uh, which was interesting. I would say that the biggest one I did that was the most fun was Billy Idol. Huh. Uh, oh, the Rebel Yell! Yeah. Yeah. Oops! Oh, what is that? What's happening? Ooh. Well, that was the Rebel Yell. <laughs> That's I've, a, got, okay. I've got another question for Craig. Oh, there's no politics. Is, 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 are you ready? Tom, uh, what is it about? Tom has is a question. Is Alanis hot? Is Alanis Morissette hot? Oh, 1994, yeah. sure. <laughs> um, I, yeah, it, it, uh, it, it depends on your definition of hot, probably, uh, which I don't want to get into. Um too she crunchy. Was, she was smart hot. Let's put it that yeah. way. She was uh, she was that uh, the kind of uh, moody girl in the flannel shirt in the back of college bike classes who uh, he figured it was easy but was always interesting to talk to. Did she fire <laughs> up the football team? Uh, she would probably fire up the chess team. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. When I was out in Boston, you'd have all these girls, uh, Irish Catholic girls at those uh, Catholic, uh, private Catholic schools. They went, they, they'd barely give you a kiss. Then inevitably they're going to go fire up the entire DC yeah, football they, team they, those before settling down. They go wild, those Catholic <laughs> girls. They just let it build up and build up. And Billy then it, Joel. Yes. They start a little too late. Yep, and you yep. Have to, like a volcano. Now they got to catch up. Wall. Yes. <laughs> well, when you say they start late, would that include after the age of 50? Because that's kind of my marketplace. So. I'm from a different generation. I put it a little closer to the, the voting age. Remember, this is this is New Hampshire. <laughs> no, so I'm trying to. I, I have vivid memories of New Hampshire now uh, being uh, told to wait to do my interview with the Boston Herald until they interviewed an actual pig. So, uh, <laughs> oh, going to be my last Remember the pig? No. Of, uh, it was a Bernie... Sp- what? The pig was a Bernie Sanders supporter. Remember? The, the pig was, and the pig actually got on the air, and I did not. So I don't know why that's... Uh, <laughs> The bir- there was this little pig in front of J.D. Stavard. Yeah. A little Vietnamese pot bellied pig. Yeah. And it had a Bernie button on it. it That's Ber- how silly everything is. Bernie's Jewish. Isn't he supposed to avoid pork? Well, he's secular. Oh, right. He's That's true. Uh, good point. Yeah. Yeah. But it was evocative. The yippies. Only in s- dead pork. The oh, okay. Gotcha. Yippies in 68. Uh, they nominated the pig. What did they? Did they name it Mayor Daly, Tom, or was it Pegasus? I can't remember. <laughs> they did. If you go on, the Yippies nominated a yeah. pig for president. We got two oh, wow. minutes That's left. Uh, Craig, uh, why don't you wrap up uh, and make a pitch for your book? John, can uh, we get the book on the back? First, I should probably tell you how to get it. Right. That would be helpful. Please, yes. Uh, the candidate says it. Uh oh. The candidate We got cut uh, off. <laughs> no, we're, we're okay. Uh, you can get it on Amazon, Carl. Yeah. Pegasus. What? Yeah. You can get the We had a little uh, technical difficulty here. Uh, what, you want him on for a few minutes on your show? I've got a guest oh, coming on, okay. so otherwise I would love it. But. Amazon.com. Uh, go to Amazon or go to the publisher. Uh, the publisher's name Bob the Mystic Books. B O B T I M Y S T I C. dot com. Bob the Mystic Books. dot com. I'll put a link up there, or go to Amazon. Well, thank you very much, Craig. Maybe we'll have you back if we can ever track uh, Vermin Supreme, Don. Uh, thank you, thank you, Matt. Absolutely, thank, thank you. you. Tom. And Another great uh, episode you're, of Ward 13. You're going to have yes. to wait till Manstadam tonight for the, the announcement. I was oh. wearing the orange coat oh. in vain. Oh. Thank you from Ward 13. We'll see you next week. Maybe Yay. we'll do a baseball show. Who knows? <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>